Hi, everyone. Welcome to the very first episode of Out of Character, where I will unmute my microphone so that you can hear me as I'm doing the introduction. It's a new show where your favorite creators drop out of character for an hour to talk with game designer and host Mark Tassin, that'd be me, about their art, their process, and the nerdy stuff that inspires them. From the secrets behind their craft, to the ins and outs of the business, to the nerdy games and shows and books that they can't get enough of, it's a unique and candid look at the people who create the stuff we love. Comments are going to be open throughout the show, and although we can't make promises, there's a chance we'll be able to pull in some of your comments and questions while we're talking. So, without additional preamble and with the mic unmuted, I am thrilled to introduce Out of Character's very first guest, Matt Forbeck. Welcome to the show, Matt. Hey, Mark. How you doing? I am doing Wait, great. you can hear me, though, right? We're all good. <laughs> yes, yes, I can actually hear you, so Excellent. we're in good shape. <laughs> So, how are you doing tonight, Matt? Thanks for joining us for our uh, official first show, season Woo-hoo! one, episode one. <laughs> I'm doing fantastic. It's really good to see you, and I am honored to be your first guest on this, what will hopefully be a long run of fantastic shows. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. It'd be great. Um, so, you know, Matt, I know who you are, and probably a lot of people know who you are, but I want to just take a minute to uh, let you just tell folks a little bit about yourself, about who you are, what you create. And uh, just give them a little bit of background for those who may not know you by name, but may know what you bit, what you okay, can make. Okay, sure. Um, I should go over to my shelf here and grab all the books off and whatever. But um, <laughs> my name is Matt Forbeck. If you want to know more about me, go to forbeck.com, F-O-R-B-E-C-K.com. Or you can find me on Twitter and Facebook and all those other good places too, uh, Instagram, whatever. And uh, I do all sorts of stuff. I started out as a tabletop game designer way back in the 80s, I guess, Uh and it was worked on things for second edition and third edition Dungeons and Dragons and writing stuff for fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons nowadays. Um, I'm well known for having, uh, I write Halo novels. I write Minecraft Dungeon novels. I write, I've written about 35 novels that have been published to date. I wrote a couple of editions of the Marvel Encyclopedia, which was on the New York Times bestseller list for six months. One of them was. Um, I've written books for Blood Bowl and Dungeons and Dragons and the Endless Quest series for D&D. Uh, I write for video games, too. Uh, my latest thing was Biomutant, which came out last spring, which did pretty well. And I'm currently working on Warhammer 40,000 Tacticus, which is a mobile game coming from Snowprint Studios. And Hard West 2 coming from Ice Code Games, which is a studio out in Poland. Uh, that's been announced. I'm working on another video game I can't tell you about yet because a lot of things get put under non-disclosure agreement. Uh, currently, I also have uh, Shotguns and Sorcery, which is this baby here. There we go. Um, yep. There we go. Look, he's got the fifth edition yeah, source right there. Character. Man, you're a good person. <laughs> um, and so I'm working on that, which is a, a fifth edition source book based. Well, the one I have back here is the Cipher System role playing game. That is the fifth edition source book that's going to be coming out this summer that we did a Kickstarter for back in November or so. And my son Marty actually did all the rules for it. So I get to work with my eldest son on that, which has been kind of a blast. And that's based yeah. on some novels I wrote about 10 years ago that are continuing to do stuff with. Um, we also, oh, the other big thing I got is I'm working on this thing called the Marvel Multiverse Role Playing Game. Yeah, um, I might have heard something yeah, about that. You know, I don't know. Marvel, I, a few people have heard about it. Right? There we go. Yeah. yeah. So the playtest rule book will be out on April 20th, although I think the uh, the e, the electronic edition, which is going to be through Comixology or whatever, is going to be out on April 19th, if you believe their website. Um, so you can get a chance where it's like $9.99, which is pretty cheap. It's 120 pages, uh, comic book sized. Uh, it's not the whole game. That's the reason it's a play test rule book. But the whole game will be coming out in 2023 as a massive 300-some page, uh, 8.5 by 11 hardcover with cram full of amazing Marvel artwork. So, uh, And I've been working on that for a couple years now, on and off. So it's been really exciting to finally get that out in people's hands and let them see it. No, I'm excited to see that as well. I know that most of it is top secret at the moment, except for the fact that it exists and it's coming. Um, but I, I'm sure a lot of us who have missed having a, a published Marvel RPG out there for us to play are looking forward to that. It but is I guess let me ask you about this, Matt. <laughs> sure. You know, Marvel is a great starting point in talking about the things that we like and that inspire us. You know, what is your background with Marvel? Like, how did you discover Marvel originally? Yeah, I, the funny part is I don't think I can remember days when I didn't know Marvel, right? Um, I actually, one of the first things I learned how to read on were comic books. My, uh, my parents got me the Spidey comics, which were teamed up with the Electric Company, right? Um, oh, yeah, right. came on after Sesame Street when I was a kid. 
uh, which has you know, been long dead. But they had, uh, and then the cover, this guy named Easy Reader says, reading is cool. It's Spidey Comics from Marvel <laughs> Comics. Easy Reader, turns out, was Morgan Freeman, for God's sake, right? Um, oh, my God, I didn't realize that. I used yeah. to watch that, too. <laughs> <laughs> so like, oh, you know, 30 years later, you're like, no, he's the voice of God. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. um, but, yeah, I, I learned how to read on that kind of stuff when I was, like, you know, three, four years old. And, uh, you know, my dad I was a big fan of comic books when he was growing up. His mother threw all of his out, so we never got to see any of them when he went to college. Uh, this is, you know, the stereotypical way it goes. Yeah, um, right. Which meant they, they, he was very careful, he and my mother both, even though they split, were very careful about not throwing my stuff out, too. So I actually have uh, more long, long boxes than I care to think about uh, stuck in an attic around here someplace. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I was always a big fan of Marvel comics growing up. I loved, uh, you know, uh, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and the Basimis, uh, Basami, John Basima, uh, uh -huh. you know, senior and junior and all the other good stuff. And yeah, is that Busima? I've never known Quad to pronounce it. I think it so. Properly. I've never met either of them. I've never met okay. the family. So, um, and George Perez, you know, and all these other great guys. Oh, yeah. George, you know, shout out to George, who's actually uh, in hospice at the moment. So, yeah. Um, so hopefully, you know, he'll, he's just a legend. And it's, fortunately, we've had a chance for people to say, hey, we appreciate how much you've done for us and how much you entertain us over the years. So uh, even though yeah. we're all going to miss him, it's been a, a, a good, long goodbye with him. So. I mean, he even did a con, uh, yeah. a last con, just so that he could sign the last book yeah, for people. Right? Right? So, I mean, uh, that, like, that yeah, is... I'm sick, but I care about you guys enough. I'm going to show up just so that you can <laughs> get that one last thing. So I can see it one last time, right? right? I don't want anybody saying, oh, God, I should have seen George, you know? Um, so it's, you know, it, so I grew up reading comic books. I love comic books from an early age. Uh, when I was, uh, uh, when I, I used to run a company called Pinnacle Entertainment Group. We did a game called uh, Brave New World, which was a dystopian superheroes game that I created. Yeah. Uh, and before that, actually, I worked on the Wildstorms collectible card game with Jim Lee and Drew Bittner, who was one of the editors over Wildstorm, which was uh, Jim's division of Image Comics. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been involved in uh, in superhero games for a long time. In fact, one of the first role playing games I played after I started playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons, of course, I started playing uh, both visions of vi villains and vigilantes and champions. And then oh, the yeah. first big role playing game book I ever wrote was uh, by myself was Western Hero, which came out for the champions rule system, the hero rule system that, that powers champions. And that was back in like 91 or 92 or something like that. Uh, yeah. And Monty Cook was actually my editor on that book, believe it or not. <laughs> so uh, you go back, you know, Monty was the guy, one of the guys behind third edition, and actually the guy who wrote the cipher system that we used for the cipher system role playing game uh, for shotguns and sorcery. So yeah. it all comes around. Um, but yeah, well, and that's kind of what I was saying to you about at the beginning is that I assume that pretty much anyone watching this today has probably read or played or watched something that you've worked on, whether they know it or not, right? Because yeah. at some point it's probably crossed in front of them. That's always the funny part, because unless you're really paying attention, especially in games, right? In a novel, you know, your name's right on the cover, right? But if you're not paying attention to the games... Um, for a long time, the games, you know, some games still don't even have the creator's names inside the rule book, much mm -hmm. less on the front of the box, right? If you go to like Hasbro or, or Mattel, uh, you know, some of the bigger companies, they don't put the, the creator's names on it. So, yeah. or they use a house name, right? So it's not quite the same thing. Um, so it's been quite of a revolution over the years to have people figure that out. But still, it's like, like my wife watches television and films with me does not care about the names of the actors, directors, anything like that, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a fan. I'm like, oh, I know what he was saying. <laughs> connecting yeah, it all together, yeah. creating this crazy multiverse in my head. Um, but not everybody ever cares about that, right? And that's okay. I mean, I write for lots and lots of different uh, corners of fandom, right? So, yeah. Uh, yeah, like you say, chances are pretty good you've run across my name in something. But, you know, hopefully you'll go back and check out your bookshelf at some point. And say, Ooh, that was you know, good. I had somebody just say that... Uh, they thought Western Hero had one of the best section titles ever, which was How to Ride Your Horse Off a Cliff into Water. <laughs> which, honestly, you've got to have that, right? I mean, that's a given. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love doing that. There was like how to ride, how to run across the top of a train, how to slide a bad guy down the bar, you know, all sorts of crazy <laughs> stuff. So. Look, if you're going to play a Western game and you don't cover those rules, then you're not really doing a Western game, right? I think that's, that's absolutely true, right? Man, the research for that was fun because it was back before the internet. So basically, I just sat around watching Western movies for you know weeks on end. Um, <laughs> it was now, terrifying. <laughs> someone did say um, they want to know how do you think you came to be known as the most negligent parent in gaming? It <laughs> must have been hard. 
I think this person might have an agenda because their last yeah. name happens who, to be the same this? as I yours. I can't see the name. So <laughs> hmm, it's probably one of my kids. Uh, I think that might be the case. Yeah, yeah. yeah. an M4 back. I, I don't oh, know. That would be my out. son, Martin, <laughs> who I just said, hey, thanks, Marty, who uh, actually wrote the rules for the uh, Shotguns and Sorcery 5th Edition. thing. How did I get to know? I think it's because of my kids' efforts to paint me with a very broad brush. So. Okay, that makes <laughs> sense. Yeah, I can see that. Well, you know, in, as far as like working on something like Marvel goes, I think one of the toughest things, especially these days when there's with the internet giving such sort of a focus on these projects, you know, how do you work with an IP like that? I mean, you have an IP that is like absolutely beloved and that everyone's got their opinions on. And, you know, what sort of, how do you do that? How do you wake up well, in the morning and go, all right, I can do this and not be like frozen solid with, with fear over this? Uh, ask me in three weeks, right? When that comes <laughs> out, or two, two weeks. I guess two well, weeks from today out. is when the ebook comes out. And then tomorrow is when the, the, or two weeks from tomorrow is when the print book comes out. Ask me then how the reaction comes. Yeah. Right? Well, one of the things I was, I built a pretty thick skin over the years to criticism. I, I, you know, if somebody wants to tell me I suck, like get in the back of the line. There's plenty of other people in front of here, <laughs> including my children, apparently. So I'm not so worried about that. They get first crack, okay? And my wife gets first, first crack. But, you know, the kid's right after her. Um, so, you know, uh, yeah, I've written other stuff for Marvel before. I wrote two editions of Marvel Encyclopedia. I wrote an Avengers source book uh, for DK Publishing, mm -hmm. Avengers Encyclopedia. I wrote a Captain America book. I actually wrote a game or created a game called Marvel Heroes Battle Dice for Playmates toys uh which did you know the uh, teenage mutant ninja turtles and star trek and all those other things and that actually you know like that had a television commercial it was in walmart and toys <laughs> R us and target and all that and i'm like okay you know i think i can handle doing a role-playing game it's gonna be okay right um, nowadays people have a lot more access to you but i mean uh, even when brave new world came out i had conventions where people would just kind of buttonhole me and say let me tell you how your game sucks and why and <laughs> oh no you know, like 99% of the people are just like, hey, I loved it. It was great. It was fun. And then you get the guy who's just like, not only did I hate it, but I need to give you the entire diatribe in person. So <laughs> I've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> so if you, you can know, put up with the guy doing that, you can put up with the rest of the stuff. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, definitely. Especially in, in person, no less. No, so I was I, impressed. I'm like, God, <laughs> you know, you've got some cojones, son. You know, it's, I, I salute your courage, sir. That's exactly. exactly. <laughs> you're, you're, that, I've never seen such a staggering lack of tact. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so let me let me ask what do you think is someone who really took a cherished ip and did right by it like not necessarily they did the perfect version for you but they picked it up and they worked with it and you went like yeah they get they get it i love what they did with it well i mean the classic answer because everybody who ever does anything in comic books you're basically doing fan fiction based on what the original characters did yeah creators did, right so the classic version is well you got to look at the dark knight by frank miller right yeah and uh and watchman by uh alan moore and, and dave gibbons but of course that's really based upon his rift characters neil charlton characters yeah uh, way back in the day but I think the Dark Knight is when you, you say, wow, you know, you can really tell any kind of stories you really want to with these different kinds of characters. You don't need to be beholden to anything in particular. In games, you know, there's all sorts of great stuff out there. I think Eric Lang does a lot of great adaptations for different things. Uh, there's Bloodborne card games and uh, the Marvel stuff that he's done. Um, I actually think the last edition of the Marvel role-playing game was pretty damn good. I and I was one of the people who worked on it, but mm -hmm. that was really Cam Banks's thing. Um, and the game didn't last very long but it was more of a monetary thing than anything else i think as a game design yeah. it really did hit its its marks really well um and that said the game i'm working on is going to go in an entirely different direction because i don't really always see the point of going over ground that's been covered already right even yeah. if it was covered 12 years ago but you, you go out and buy those books now so why the heck would i give you a new version of that right i'm yeah. gonna give you something that's new uh with my design partners and everything else and and uh, hopefully we'll entertain you in a whole new way that you weren't expecting. But you know, that's either. actually a really cool way to approach a creative project because the reality is that I have all of the TSR Marvel superheroes books that Jeff Grubb and Stan and those yep. guys wrote, right? I've got them downstairs. We played it about a year ago. And oh, I did. Yeah, I played the right? out of that game. <laughs> oh, yeah, we love that game. There's a great picture right. of me with like a mullet in the kitchen with all my buddies <laughs> all set up playing Marvel. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the thing is, though, is that if I want to play those games, I can. And it does, yeah. that makes a lot of sense that if you're just rewriting the same thing, you're not really giving us something different to play. 
Exactly. I mean, especially with the internet now, those things are out there. I mean, you can find illegal versions in, of, of the Marvel stuff from TSR and just download it whenever the hell you want, right? Trivial thing to do. Yeah. Because uh, they're not for sale or available anywhere else at the moment, unless you, you know, eBay or whatever else. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you want any particular version of the game, that's one of the reasons I always think that the idea of a dead game is kind of funny, right? Mm -hmm. uh, people are like, oh, it's not being supported anymore. I'm like, it's still the same game it was last year or the year before or 10 years ago. Just because it doesn't have new products coming out for it doesn't mean it's, it's uh, been ripped out of the face of the planet and you can't do anything with it, right? Um, it means that you might have a harder time finding new players or there's not going to be as much excitement about it. But if you love it, keep playing it. You know, Just mm -hmm. do whatever the heck you want with it. Yeah, it's true. I, I think part of that comes from the fact that there's two aspects to the hobby when it comes to role-playing games. There's the aspect of playing the games and there's the aspect of collecting the games. Yep. And if it's not making new stuff, you like I have more books than I will ever know what to do with or read through because I well, like sure. to collect them. But that's a different thing, right? Don't you think? It is. And I mean, one of the things about role-playing games too, and especially like the Marvel game, I know there's going to be a lot of people out there who are never going to play the game. who are going to buy it because they want to be able to see their char the characters they love statted out as, you know, like, let's see how Captain America's strength uh, works versus Spider-Man or the Hulk or whatever, right? They're going to yeah. be excited about that kind of stuff. Uh, so you're going to have a certain number of people, anytime you produce any kind of a role-playing, that, that uh, are don't even intend to play it or never going to play it. Some right. people are just going to put it on a shelf. Honestly, your money all spends the same, so it's okay. Uh, but we, you know, because we love the game, we want to encourage people to play it because we want to share it with you, right? We want other people to right. enjoy it at the level we're doing. So we try to make the best game we can. But when you're writing it, you also have to remember that, you know, a lot of people who play the game are never going to read the book because they're just going to be taught by their game master or the narrator, as we call it in the Marvel game. You know, the, the, the yeah. game master is going to sit down and say, uh, this is how you play. This is the character you can explain it to you. And you may never crack open a rule book in your entire time you play it, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whereas the game master, or whoever it is, has to actually sit down and read the book and understand it. Uh, now that's changed a bit. Now you can actually learn games without actually even doing that. You can go and watch Critical Role and you learn how to play D&D or there's lots of how to play videos out there. Uh, yeah. So even if you've never read anything, you can still play things, which is kind of phenomenal. Um but, you know, when you're writing this stuff, you're like you're writing for the reader, the person that's going to instruct other people how to do this and how to make it happen. And so you have to make sure you're clear and succinct and also entertaining at the same time. Right. Because if it's dry and boring, nobody's going to churn their way through a 350 page. Book, you know? Right. Well, and I think, though, that when you talk about people reading or not reading the, the rule books, I think some of it depends on the game and the mm -hmm. level of engagement that you and your group have, and the type of books that are available. I think that's one of the challenges too, is, is there a book available for the player and for the game master? Is there a book available that this player really wants to dig into so to learn more to how to play their character better and bring in stuff and having enough cool stuff that they can use in the game that can give them benefit, right? Right, and yeah. Sometimes that's just not there. And so as a result, you end up with players who are just like, yeah, just tell me what to do. I'm good. Yeah, exactly. Right. Or it's on my sheet. That's all I need to know, right? They're yeah, not thinking exactly. about the future right. or leveling up or whatever else. So, uh, it gets tricky. You know, it's it's a hard thing for people to figure out. And as a game designer doing this for, you know, 30 some years now, uh, it, you know, it is an ongoing challenge. And there's a lot of different ways that people try to solve it over the years. Uh, honestly, I'd kind of given up on doing role-playing games like this uh, a few years ago. I, I would write chapters mm -hmm. of different things. I wrote a chapter of Tales from the Flood, for instance, and bunches of other stuff. Just, you know, people would ask me to chip in things here and there. Uh, but I didn't think I was ever going to go back and write a whole role-playing game again. But then, you know, when somebody, when Marvel knocks on your door and says, hey, are you interested? <laughs> you don't say no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the games. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, so let me ask you this. One of the things that comes up a lot these days is you've got the books that are, you know, a lot of times there's so much content to consume before you start playing that you feel a little overwhelmed by it at times. I mean, how, as a, what's, what's your thought on that? On Is it okay because that's the hobby or do you need to deal with that or? I think there's, there's a lot of ways to handle that. I mean, again, uh, if the, as long as you have one person at the table who knows what they're doing and it doesn't even have to be the person mm -hmm. in charge, right? Um, right. Then you can run, go ahead and play the game however you want, right? As, as long as one person alone knows what they're doing. Uh, one way a lot of uh, publishers solve this is they do quick start rules just to say, say this is how the game works. This is a character. Here's some pregens. Go. And it might be like a 32 page book or whatever you say. This. I mean, essentially what we're doing with the uh, the playtest rule book is kind of the same thing. It's uh, you know, here's some of the powers. Here's the here's the book. Here's how it works. 
uh, here's some characters and here's a little adventure in the back and you go and have some fun with them, right? And then tell us how we screwed it up and how you broke it because then <laughs> we want to incorporate that into the actual full-on rule book when we do that, right? It's right. kind of neat to be able to do this dry run too, to be able to say, hey, uh, you know, as much as we'd like to, one of the problems of doing any kind of a game this large is that it's almost impossible to play test it properly, right? Uh, there's mm -hmm. just too many different uh, ramifications of every different rule change. You don't know how it's all going to fit together. Uh, you know, it, same thing happens with collectible games. There's just so many different ways for the uh, the cards to mingle and intermix with each other and overlap with each other that the only way to play test something that size is on the market. Yeah. So that's what we're doing, right? We're going to play test it with the market. Uh, and, you know, some people are like, well, I don't want to pay for a play test. I'm like, it's like 10 bucks, guys. If you don't want to play or you don't want to pay that much, <laughs> fine. You can wait for the real thing to come out when it comes out. But uh, $10 is basically covering the bare minimum of what we're doing here, especially if you get the print copy. Um, you know, $10 for a 120-page book, full color all the way through. is pretty pretty sharp. Yeah, that's fantastic. Kind of comics, right? um, and, you know, you'll have a uh, fun thing to play with. And this way, when you're done playing all this stuff, you'll be able to say, oh, good. I, I saw this. I saw it was developing. I see what they're trying to do here. And you, hopefully, you know, you come up with some, ide some ideas that will say, oh, that's a that's a really good point, you know, um, or, oh, yeah, we screwed that up. Or, you know, ideally, everybody will just say, yeah, that was the best game ever. Don't change a thing. But right. <laughs> that's that's a fool's paradise. That's well, you happens. know, part of this, though, I think some of it falls back on this whole idea of balance. And I'm going to stand on my soapbox a little bit and just say that I think balance is overrated. Oh, God. Right? <laughs> I think it's way overrated. And I think that games don't have to be completely balanced and they can be really broken and really fun at the same time, right? That's not what makes a game fun is how the, perfectly all the rules fit together, which is why for me, when you say, well, it's a play test version, I'm like, I don't care. I, I mean, I'm sure I'm going to have a blast. In fact, you'll probably fix some things that I'll be really sad about that I'm like, oh, I know it was broken, but it was cool. We loved it, right? Broken in a good way, right? Yeah, exactly, right? Now, I mean, it's hard to, it's very hard to balance a role-playing game, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just because, again, it, you don't really, there's no such thing as balance because there's so many different contextual things that can happen that can change things, right? It's like, uh, who, anytime you say who would win, you know, Thor or Hulk, you know who's going to win? It's who the writer wants to win because they're going to build the context <laughs> right. around it that puts it in that direction, right? And, uh, you know, you don't, you barely ever have two guys who just stand there and punch each other. Until, and that's a context of its own. I mean, put them in the boxing ring like, you know, Superman versus Muhammad Ali did back in the 70s, right? Um, so you you just really can't balance the stuff out perfectly. But that's part of the fun of it is people trying to figure out different ways to make cool things happen in the game. And one of the things I try to encourage when I'm doing this stuff is, you know, you can rule lawyer, uh, rules lawyer the whole thing to death if you want to. But the idea is to have fun, to come up with characters, uh, like we have character creation rules in the game, right? But uh, the idea is to come up with characters that you're going to enjoy playing yeah, and to have fun with them. Uh, I remember uh, playing with my kids at D&D &D many years ago. Uh, you know, Marty, if you're listening, you'll try to spare you from this. But they would do things. I'm like, well, they're like, well, let's just build Molotov cocktails and all this kind of stuff. I'm like, okay. You can do all this stuff. You can reverse engine. You, you can maybe make a, a space shovel eventually here. It's, but uh -huh. that's not the spirit of the game. That's not the game you're trying to play here. So if you want to do that, that's a whole different kind of game. We could do that. But if you want to, and we'll do that for fun here for a while. But if you want to play D&D &D the way it was meant to be played or any other game that may, it, it was meant to be played, you have to think about what is the spirit of the game? What are they trying to do here? What's the entertainment experience they're trying to get across? In your private lives, of course, you can screw with the game as much as you want to and do whatever the heck you want with it. Mm -hmm. I have people say, can I build this character? Well, you, know, you do whatever you want. You know, just don't tell me about it. You know, it's, <laughs> I, I can't officially have anything to do with that. But you know, uh, build whatever the heck you want with whatever rule system you want and have fun with it. As long as you're having fun, you're not doing it wrong, right? Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that you know, a good example is if you look at Spider-Man and everyone just reads through the Spider-Man stories, they love them. And yet... There's an issue of Spider-Man. I forget which number it is. It might have actually been when he was on in Avengers at one point, uh, being a guest star. He's fighting Fire Lord, a herald of Galactus. Right. And he basically beats him. And I'm like, right. okay. Right. And then next mm. week, fourth <laughs> bugs knock him out in an alley, right? Exactly. I mean, the, the reality is that it's all about the adventure, the story you're telling. And I feel like at the end of the day, that's those are the games that for me, in terms of a role-playing experience, where the, the role part, R-O-L-E part of it is important, is do you walk away with a story that you're still telling 20 years later? 
Right, right. And yeah, then, can you step away from the table and say, "Man, the coolest thing just happened! I got to go tell everybody." You know, exactly right. That's that's why it's great. That, and that's actually, I think, one of the reasons actual play does pretty well because you can actually lean over people's shoulders and say, hmm, "Wait, this might be actually cool." So, um, yeah, yeah. That's just been an amazing renovation or a revolution, really, going on in the industry for the last what five, six years now. So it's been kind have of. Have you done actual action. play ever? Matt, I don't know if you have. I have done, uh, yeah, I've done some charity streams, right? Okay. Uh, for like Jasper's Game Day, which, you know, is a teen suicide prevention thing, that uh, a charity that uh, basically runs Dungeons & Dragons games online. So I've done a few of those. I've never run anything online like that. Uh, maybe at some point in my life I will, but it's like many other things. It just has to get on the schedule with, you know, everything else <laughs> I have to do. Right? There's so much to do. Yes. Yeah. And so many, and I mean that in a positive way, not oh, the, yeah. oh, we've all got work to do, but, which we do. But the, the reality is that it's, there's so much content out there these days. In fact, this is something I wanted to ask you about. There's sure. so much content, uh, everything from movies to TV shows, to comics, to online comics, to everything you can imagine. You know, you come out with something like shotguns and sorcery, which is really cool. And, right. you know, how do you, you know, do you need to get a big audience? Do you, you, know, do you, you can know, you get you an you audience? Ask an audience. You, you want a big audience because the bigger the audience, the more money you make, the more you can do with this, et cetera. Right, the more you can do. But, yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot, you know, if you're getting into the gaming industry or in, actually in any kind of entertainment for the money, you're probably doing it for the wrong reasons, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, uh because you know the, like a lot of businesses and a lot of entertainment especially there's a very tiny amount of people at the top who are making boatloads of money everybody else is kind of like uh well the vast majority of them are struggling of not making anything yeah. and they wash out and go off and do something else because they realize they can't do it at least make money at it they can do it you can keep doing it as a hobby for as long as you like right but when you have to mm -hmm. actually start putting up money for things that's when you have to uh start making hard decisions yeah. So I, I'm not all that worried about it. I, I I try to create things. I put things out there that are mine, their original creations. And if they strike fire, then great. You know, we chase them as long as we can. And if they don't, then you know, I'll move on to the next thing. Um, I'm not one of these people like like Jared Tolkien who had you know an entire one world in his mind, but he built out every little thing where you could figure out like the color of the teacups and the hobbits cabinet, <laughs> or whatever, right? Yeah. I, I I'm not that obsessive compulsive essentially. So. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I'm more like, ah, this is a cool thing. And I chase the shiny thing and I'm like, oh no, this is a cool thing. And I chase that shiny thing. Um, and you know, I would, again, at one point in my life, I said, you know, I'm done doing tie in stuff. I'm not going to do that. And I'm going to do original stuff. And then I think it was Halo that brought me back in. Right. Yeah. I, uh, Edge Schlesinger over at pocket books wrote me, in, uh, cause I had written a Guild Wars novel for him a few years before that. And, uh, it's funny because I saw the notice go out that they had gotten the license for Halo. And I, I was right. I wrote him and said, Ed, you told me if I did this book for you, there might be more in the future. This is the future. <laughs> and uh, he writes me back and says, Matt, I was literally writing this email to you right now saying, are you interested? And I'm like, mm, good, good man. Um, but that was something like I played Halo with my kids. I actually knew I got to visit the Bungie Studios back before, when they were in Chicago before Microsoft bought them and saw an early demo of Halo like a year or two before it came out. Oh, wow. Because uh, I was interviewing with them for another gig, uh, working on one of their other games. And uh, Bob Settles over there showed me how to, uh, the game worked. I was like, holy cow. So when the Xbox came out, I'm like, take my money, give me the game, I play. And I've been a big fan of Halo ever since. So when I saw that, I'm like, okay, I'm going back into tie and stuff. And, you know, uh, it's it's a good problem to have when people uh, ask you to work on things that you care about. Right? Yeah. Now, let me, do, do you have any hope of seeing any of your creations show up in the uh, Halo series that's coming oh. out? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, right? I'll tell you, one of the things I do, though, when I'm working on tie-in novels, and I think people, uh, so they sometimes have this question, like, well, do you put all your best ideas into the tie-in stuff? Why don't you save those for your original things? I'm like, you know, I don't actually think of it that way, because... I don't put original ideas into the tie-in stuff. I don't come up mm -hmm. and say, this is the best thing. What I do is I read the tie-in stuff. I play the tie-in stuff. I play whatever the original stuff is. And then I riff off that with new ideas, right? Yeah. So the stuff that I'm writing for Halo is not something I would ever write for myself, right? The stuff I'm writing for Minecraft Dungeons or whatever, or whatever else I'm working on is not something I would ever write for myself. So I don't feel like I'm losing out by putting my heart into these things as much as I possibly can. Because, uh, you know, I can reserve those things. I've already got those. But those ideas are tailored to these other things I've come up with rather than being tailored to Halo or whatever, right? So, yeah. you know, I, 
I, it's not really a, as much of an issue as people think. A lot of aspiring writers are like, but I want to save my best ideas. Save them. You know, come up with a Halo idea. Come up with a Spider-Man idea. Come, you know, come up yeah. with an Avengers idea. But, you know, if you have a greatest Avengers idea, are you really going to save that for something else you're working on? That seems kind of strange, you know, because it, if it's tailor-made for the Avengers, it's probably not tailor-made for whatever you're, you're coming up with on your own. Well, and, you know, that, that kind of brings up a point that I think that when I've seen people successfully work within another IP, within a shared world, it's because they haven't tried to completely break the mold. They've yeah. tried to say, what is it about this IP that has made it so popular and so loved? And how can I, I tell something new and interesting within the context of that, those ideas? And it kind of sounds like that's what you're talking about, which is probably where some of your success comes from, Matt, is, you know, when you work on these, that's the way you're thinking is not, how do I completely create something out of the ordinary? <laughs> Instead, you're like, how do I take Halo stuff and make it just another really cool Halo story? Right. I mean, I think some people come in and are like, well, I'm going to break this and do it the right way. I'm like, well, you know, if you're yeah. digging that way, you probably don't care enough about what it originally was anyway, right? Yeah. You're, you're caring about your own vision, which mm -hmm. is great, but then you should go and do your own vision on your own yeah. thing, right? Don't bring your vision into something else. I mean, you come up with your, what your take on that thing would be, right? Uh, you don't come up, you don't try to force something that's not natural, a natural fit to what it is. Uh, and I think it's healthy for you too, because then, you know, like a lot of times you're working on stuff, it just doesn't get produced. Uh, novels get canceled, games get canceled. Mm -hmm. Half the video games I've worked on in my life have been canceled, right? And, and that's pretty much the standard thing. I have a lot of friends in the gaming and video game industry who have worked on games for, you know, a decade, different games. Nothing they've worked on has ever been produced. They've gotten mm -hmm. paychecks, they've gotten benefits, they've got a good job, whatever else. Uh, but, you know, you don't get into this stuff, again, for exclusively for the money. You, obviously, you want to make enough to, to live on. But uh, you get out there because you want to have this stuff you want to share with the world. So it kind of crushes you a little bit inside when these things don't happen. But you just have to uh, kind of take that as like, you know, some of these things are not going to happen. Some of them yeah. will. And you don't have control over that. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's funny. When you're talking about uh, coming up with your own thing or understanding of characters, I do just want to give a shout out to one of my all time folks who I think are like an expert at this is John Byrne. I oh. figure of all he'll John Byrne, when he picks up a story and tells it, he tells a Wolverine story and you're like going, that's Wolverine. He yep. tells a vision story and it's vision. He tells a human torch from the golden age or silver age story. And it's the right human torch. Right. I, I just feel yeah. like that takes a real talent and work and effort and understanding to, to do that. Yeah, Mark Waid is another guy who does that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. He takes those original things like we did with Kingdom Come or The Flash or whatever. And just uh, Mark's, you know, I'm pretty knowledgeable about comic books. I would not even want to get in a, a trivia contest with Mark. He would wipe the floor with everybody. <laughs> right. Well, and I think this goes back to Frank Miller, you know, which we talked about earlier in The Dark Knight, is that even though those characters were very different in a lot of ways from what people were used to seeing, you still read it and thought, yeah, that's Batman. Yeah, super. Exactly. It's it's something's different about it, but it's capturing that essence. It's just like magic to me. I feel like that's probably one of the most fun things about working on an IP is how do you, that belongs to someone else and that people know is how do you capture the things that make people love it so much? You yeah. I, I've worked on a game called Monster Rancher. I worked on a Monster Rancher mm -hmm. card game, which was based upon a TV show and a PlayStation one game that came out from Japan back in the nineties. Uh, and when they, when I was asked to design the game, I'm like, I don't know anything about this guys. Uh, and they're like, here. And they, you know, shoved like 26 VHS tapes at me back in the day. And I sat down and watched 13 hours <clears throat> of cartoons. And by the end of it, I loved it. I was like, oh, I get it. I, get, I understand why you love these characters and what the excitement's about. And what, you know, the whole thing when you're trying to do this is you have to drill down to those core things that people care about and then see how you can translate those things into whatever medium you have to be working in, right? Mm -hmm. Take it from the original story or the original medium and then translate it into something that's yours uh, but that still resonates uh, with people in the same way, if that makes sense, right? You want to be able to yeah. show those fans of that, that uh, the respect they deserve, honestly. You know, if somebody's a fan of this thing and they step up and give you their money, they deserve to have your respect and have uh, you put all your heart into that and make it something that you'll hope they will love as well. Yeah. Not just something that you're like, you know, uh, yeah, this is the latest version. We just slapped a uh, logo on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when you were talking about that and about distilling it down, I almost wonder if that's something that doesn't make it into enough books, which is that distilled down information. Because what a lot of game masters want to do is they want to run a game, 
you know, in a role playing game, like when they play Star Wars or Marvel or something where they walk out and they're like, oh, you know what? I want this to feel like I'm in a comic book. I wonder if there's a way you can like write that for game masters. Well, we're going to find out. right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's tricky, though. I mean, I've seen other people try to do stuff like a lot of times they'll uh, do like if you're doing a superhero game, they'll do it like the, yeah. with uh, comic book lettering. And they'll say, now we're talking about this in terms of panels and pages and scenes and whatever else. Uh, or if you're talking about like uh, they, something that's based on a movie, you'll say this is done in the three act structure, blah blah blah. Uh, but I mean, at that point, you're almost giving people like a college level uh, course in how to make these things happen, right? And I'm not sure everybody wants to digest all that kind of stuff. Yeah. To be they want to they want something that's easy to digest and then to move on and have fun with it. Um, and if you can pull that off, that's really where the magic happens, right? Uh, it's well, not easy to do. I wonder though if it if it could be something as simple as saying. Uh, you know, if you want to tell a Spider-Man story, at some point he's got to be worried about money. Right. If he doesn't worry about money at some point in the story, then it's probably not going to feel like a Spider-Man story because right. I'm right. reading like all the Marvel comics starting from the 1963 and moving forward, which will probably I'll never finish. But I mean, that that's pretty much a theme through every oh. single comic. And I'm wondering if there are things like that that we could share as as writers and designers whether it's a dnd game or whether it's alien by free league or something to say like you've got to have this in it and if you do it'll feel right you know yeah, i think that you do see something if you're talking about like the alien game uh the free league yeah. game, game is fantastic with the stress dice right it's oh like, yeah i can amazing. push things but then it's going to come back to haunt me later right it's an amazing mechanic and it works really well for that property um i think with spider-man it's not just the uh the poverty that gets you it's really about the sense of responsibility that leads him to that right he's too yeah. busy caring about his neighborhood because he's the friendly neighborhood spider-man he's too busy caring about the things that are going on around him and trying to help to worry about money right yeah uh, and but then you know you get dan slot comes in and does the superior spider-man where suddenly dr octopus is part of spider-man or takes over his brain and then then he is about he's like you know what you know what? you can do a lot of good with money and then he <laughs> like, wow that's a whole other take on it you know but it actually was very true to the original character but the neat thing about it is to be actually be able to dive into that peter would never dive into that so you have to have somebody who's basically spider-man ish to dive into that and show you how it would be otherwise right and that's kind of neat to be yeah. able to pull that off and you're totally right. I mean, talking about Spider-Man, it's always because, you know, even when he was on salary for J. Jonah Jameson, every week he's worried about losing his salary because he's like, right. going, I'm supposed to go take the pictures down at the science show, but there's a robbery over here. I'll just exactly. hit the robbery real quick and then I'll still make it back. And then he doesn't and gets yelled at and loses money. And Yeah, but you yeah. know, that's a, that's a universal thing. I think we can all identify with uh, struggling between the things we want to do or we feel that we should do and you know supporting our families and all this kind of stuff right or, you know it, is it more important to make money is that going to be a long-term kind of a thing or is it more important to do the things that are important to you at the moment um and that's so, that's that kind of a struggle that the horns of that dilemma is something that almost everybody can identify with I think. so i'm gonna change gears a little bit away from the design and talk a little bit about the business because one thing that i wanted to talk about is that people always ask always because we all love this so much like i want to do this too and I think one of the first things that you pointed out is that you shouldn't go try to do this to, to make money because most people don't. And it's not a bad thing, right? I don't think that's a bad thing, but I think it's an honest thing that most people don't make a living doing this. A lot of people who are very well known have day jobs, right? Yeah. People don't even realize they do. Most writers, game designers, it's a, it's a part-time profession, right? Um, yeah. And the dream, of course, is to make it a full-time profession for a lot of people. I mean, for some people, it's not. It's like, no, I've got a fantastic day job. I just like doing this stuff on the side, which is a right. great place to be, right? If you're if you're making plenty of bank doing this stuff, that and that allows you to have the time to concentrate on your hobbies and do some professional stuff with them, some writing creation. That's great, right? I've been a full-time professional since I got out of college, just because I knew that. I knew that I wasn't going to be disciplined enough to do that stuff in my spare time. So the only way for me to actually do it was to dive in and you know, give it a whole hog. So, um, so it is tricky though. I mean, it, but you know, it's not like games or writing is a special thing. Any kind of art, any kind yeah. of creative effort is the same problem, right? It's not a problem so much as just a fact of life. You know, I often say, you know, if you start out, it's like uh, if you want to be the top rock and roll player in the world, right? You start out with a guitar, Maybe your parents get you a little toy guitar. You play that. If you're good at it, you play it. Uh, you get a real one. 
Then you might get an amp. Then you might start playing with other people. Then you might form a band. Then you might actually get a gig. Then you might actually get to tour, you know, have actual several, several dates. But it's like a pyramid that goes tighter and tighter as you get toward the top. You know, then you get a recording contract. And then you actually have an album that makes money. Then you actually, you know, get your second album. I mean, it's really tiny at the top compared yeah. to the base that you start with, right? And it's the same for every creative endeavor. I mean, whether it's, you know, painting or poetry or, well, poetry is even harder, uh, or game design or, or even video games, right? There's a lot of video game designers out there who are really trying to make it happen uh, at the indie level. And the chances of any of them actually being the next big hit, pretty small. But every now and then it happens, right? But you can't make that... <clears throat> Your business plan shouldn't be, I'm going to be the next J.K. Rowling or Stephen King or whoever else, right? You, that's not a plan. You it's can't make that plan. It's, yeah. it's like my business plan is to win the lottery. Right? You know, and, one of the things I, I wonder run. about is it, I feel like the internet right now is starting to build these microcultures that for a while didn't exist and we had this massive monoculture, but now we're sort of drifting back to this thing where I wonder if gaming and artistic endeavors could benefit from the, the whole microculture concept, the idea that you need to have an audience, but it doesn't matter if they're just in one corner of the world. It, you don't all have to be, you know, Wizards of the Coast, right? We right, can be right. just that company that sells to a small group of people and people might be able to make a good living just doing that if they're focused on that group, right? Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think that's been true for a while. I mean, the trick, of course, is that you have to be more realistic about your expectations and you probably yeah. have to cut your expenses pretty tightly. I mean, one of the reasons I've been able to do this is there was two main reasons. One is my wife provides benefits. Mm -hmm. She has a day job. Yeah. So I don't have to worry about health insurance for the kids and all that kind of stuff, right? Which is difficult in America. Other countries, you guys, ha ha, don't laugh at us. It's just the way it is. <laughs> um, but yeah. the other reason is that, uh, oh, wait a minute, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, it's You're because I live in a very inexpensive part of the world. I live in Wisconsin, right? So I can do this kind of stuff in Wisconsin or in Michigan or Virginia, the different places I lived. Mm -hmm. I, if I was living in New York City and had to pay rent in an apartment in Manhattan, yeah. the chances of me able be, being able to pull this off were pretty much zero, right? But, uh, you know, if I can make a certain amount of money, uh, the amount of money I can live in in Wisconsin, if I had that kind of money in New York, I'd be out on the street. And if <laughs> yeah. I had the kind of money I needed to live in New York, I could live like a king in Wisconsin, <laughs> right? So, right. Um, so I think that's part of it too, is, you know, yeah, you know, level your expectations to where you want to be and what you want to do. But, uh, you know, it's not going to all be, you know, red carpet premieres and all that kind of stuff. If you're lucky, you get to do these occasionally. I've been to a red carpet premiere too. It's a lot of fun, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, <laughs> you can't really bet on that happening. You know, there's a, there's a, a song from a musical called, uh, something's rotten. Mm. And it's about Shakespeare. And there's a song called Hard to Be the Bard. And I encourage everyone to listen to it because about halfway through, he starts talking about the arts and the reality of it and the difference between how much he likes being a writer, but how much he hates writing. And because it's really hard to do the writing part, right? And so it's really funny because it is a thing a lot of people experience is that there's a difference between the experience of being that writer and experience of being a person in the industry and actually right. doing the work. Right, because yeah, at the I end think, of the day, I think that's part of it. Though people they get dazzled by the top performers and whatever the hell they're doing, whatever field they're in, and they're like, "That's what I want. I want the glitz, the glamour, the money, whatever else." Yeah. But honestly, if you don't enjoy the work, <laughs> you're probably not going to get the glitz and the glamour and everything else. No. You're just building your building yourself up to suffer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the secrets for me, the one of the reasons I've been able to do this for so long, is I actually enjoy doing this. I mean, I like doing the work. If I didn't like doing the work. This would be excruciating. Right? Yeah. And that doesn't mean I don't have days where I'm like, oh, I gotta do this. I just gotta <laughs> I gotta, you know, gun my way through it and force myself to the keyboard and all that. Um, uh, yeah, used to be people would say, you know, what's your uh, how do you keep discipline? I'm like, well, I tack my mortgage above my keep my monitor over here and it keeps me on task, right? Uh, because I gotta pay my bills. I, I that's again one of the reasons I threw myself the deep end was because I knew that if I had that kind of motivation, I would do it. And I actually do enjoy it. The, and the other thing is, if I look at that and say, well, I could stop doing this, but now i got to go work for somebody else and do stuff right? I don't like. And <laughs> that seems awful. <laughs> they asked Piers Anthony once, he said, how do you get inspired? He goes, so, so you can get writing. He goes, I don't. 
He said, I just get writing. He said, when yeah, I worked exactly. at the shipyards, I didn't have to get inspired to, to work. Exactly. They just wanted me there doing my job, right? Same exactly. thing with writing and, and any sort of craft like this is that the work is work. And if it's not that you don't like it, it's just that sometimes you got to just push forward and do it. Right. Yeah. Honestly, anytime you have to do something, whether it's, you know, reading a book for school or whatever else, kind of sucks the fun out of it. Right. Yeah. You have to learn other ways to entertain yourself, to make it exciting and make it enjoyable for yourself. I mean, I, when I'm writing, I actually enjoy the process of putting words on a page and moving them around and making them go in the right order and make, watching the characters surprise me and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that's fun to me. It's really exciting. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to get into that flow state where everything just moves and it's all feels natural. But when it happens, it's magic. So, you know, I, yeah. I work and try to get to that point whenever I can. You just can't, if you're, I, some people want to have written, they don't want to write. Yeah. Right. Uh, if you want to be a writer, you should enjoy writing. That's really the best thing for you. Yeah. And it doesn't even have to be enjoy getting published, which is fun but you have to enjoy the writing in the first place, even if right. it never goes anywhere. And no. yeah, I, I agree. And I think though, that one thing that I do see though, Matt, and I sort of wondering what your thoughts on this is people talk about, you've got to love it. Well, because people love it, a lot of times they'll do stuff without getting paid or without getting oh, yeah, paid yeah, enough yeah. for it. And I think that even for someone who's new to the business, I think that's a mistake. Uh, do, you, do you think that's true? I think it's true. Although, I mean, you can see when you're young and enthusiastic and you don't know the business, you're like, I'll do anything. I'm, I'm having fun. Great. But, you know, and for your first few times through, that makes sense, right? Like yeah. When I was starting, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll write an adventure. I'll do this, whatever. It'll be fun, right? But eventually you have to start saying, well, these people are exploiting me for my labor. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. My rule of thumb is if somebody's making money off something, I should be making money off it too. Yeah. Right. Whether that's a royalty or a payment up front or whatever else. Uh, if I'm writing an adventure that's going to be run at a convention that nobody's ever making money off except, you know, whatever, I'm okay with that. I think that's okay. That's fun, right? Yeah, yeah. But if I'm writing something that gets published and somebody is charging money for that, then I should get a piece of that. Absolutely. That's the line that I have as well. And I have that line for me as a publisher, right? Oh. If I'm going to make money off it, everyone contributing is going to get compensated in some fashion. Right. They're yeah, going exactly. to be compensated for the work that they're doing in a way that's a fair market wage for the effort that they're putting in, because that's just not right. Otherwise, my business plan is other people's sweat. Right. right. You're basically advantage. exploiting other people. You're taking you're taking their time, which is money, and you're leveraging that for yourself. You're not giving them their share of it. And, you know, it's uh, it's like, for instance, you know, if also if you're paying on royalties, for instance, as opposed to exclusively as opposed to payment up front, you're yeah. basically taking out a loan on that person's work right? And mm -hmm. you're not paying them interest. You're just saying when the money comes in, you'll get some. Don't do this kind of stuff. I mean, it, come up with a plan. If you can't publish something and make sure everybody's fairly compensated, you probably shouldn't publish it, right? Yeah. Just sit on it, have fun with it, play with your friends. Uh, this is actually one of the reasons I like Kickstarter a whole lot, right? Because in the old days, you had to actually get everybody together, get some money together, take these big risks, put it out there. And you might not find out for a year or two if that thing is actually going to make money. Mm -hmm. right? Well, Kickstarter within about a month or any other crowdfunding platform <laughs> within about a month, you could say, yeah, that's great. Or mm, no, that's a bad idea. We're going to just put that away and never talk about it again. Um, and it's a much cleaner way to do things than the old way, which often involved getting loans from friends and family, which meant that you weren't welcome at Thanksgiving ever again. So yeah, yeah let's not, don't do that to yourself. Right. Or convincing uh, your wife to dip into your retirement yeah. savings. Right. And hoping that she'll forgive you later. Right. When you say, can we, I swear I'll pay it back in five years to 20. <laughs> don't do that to yourself. Right? <laughs> my advice is, you know, and everybody's like, Oh, but this is my big chance. I'm going to swing for the fence. It's like, dude, you are scamming yourself. If somebody else told you this and it was trying to sell you something, you'd say that sounds suspect. Right. If you're telling mm -hmm. yourself that stuff, you're just playing a scam on yourself. Don't be that gullible, please. Right? Yeah, uh, I, you know, I'm not trying to kill people's enthusiasm. On the other hand, if I can kill your enthusiasm with a few sentences on a on a Twitch show like this, you don't have what it's going to take to get past everything else. Right? I'm not trying to abuse you, but I'm just saying it's there's a lot of other obstacles you have to hop over. So that's the thing that shoves you off. You've probably done yourself a favor by allowing yourself to be shoved off. 
Yeah, I think the the positive in all of this is that the there is a way to get published these days. There are so many opportunities to put your awesome stuff out there, to write for other people, to do cool stuff. There are a lot of really good small publishers out there who are doing it right and and taking good care of people. And I think that people should absolutely you know, go for it. Just have realistic expectations. Don't quit your day job on day one saying, I quit my job today because I'm going into gaming, right? Mm. And I, yeah, don't do that. But <laughs> don't tell your landlord, whatever you, you do. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, someone just asked a question and sure. I want to just bring it up really quick. We're a little short on time, but he was asking about going to a writer's convention, for example, in Dallas. Um, okay. And it's like 650 bucks admission to attend. <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess it depends on what that covers. If you're talking about like your hotel and things like that, maybe. Yeah. but I, I don't know. My my thought is that it probably depends on the convention. Hearing what other people have said, on you too, and where you are in your in your journey, right? I mean, I, I'm, I, my jaw drops on like six hundred fifty dollars. I would never. On the other hand, I have a creative writing degree, so apparently, well, my parents <laughs> really paid way much more than that um, for me to get, figure out what I was doing. So, um, so I can't really knock that. Figure out if it's worth it to you and where you are in your stage in your career. If you, if you think these are good people, my, one of the other criteria I always have is uh, if somebody is running this thing and you've never heard of them and you can't find anything else they've published in the field you want to work in, they may not be the people you want to take advice from. Right? Yeah. Um, but if these are people you respect and care about, like, and they have a great reputation, like the Clarion workshops or whatever else, you know, then yeah, sure, go do it. It's fun. Right. Um, and don't mortgage your house to go do these things, right? On the other hand, I mean, Christ, if you're going to uh, like Gen Con for uh, the weekend, you're going to spend more than $650 at Gen Con just to have fun. Right? Yeah. So if you are going to this and $650 and you're like, well, it seems like a lot of money, but it's the right people. And I'm, I'm going to network with all these folks. I'm going to learn some good stuff. The funny part is the people you meet there that are going to be most important to you in your career, are probably not your instructors. They're probably going to be the people who are your fellow students. Right. Mm -hmm. They're going to be the people who are you're, you're a cohort of people who are entering the industry at the same time. And some of you are going to succeed. You guys will try to support each other as you go through, ideally, and make everybody happy that way. The people that have made the most difference in my career have been some amazing mentors that I've had, but also the people that I know that I just came up with. Right. That are, are coming up with me through the uh, whatever industry I'm talking about at the same time. Uh, and then suddenly you're like, oh, wait, you're the CEO over here. or You're the guy who's the product director over here. Uh, the, uh, the way I got the Marvel uh, assignment was John Nee was the publisher of Marvel. And John was the guy I wrote that. I, I came in and redesigned the, Mar the Wildstorm's collectible card game for it back in the early 90s. So, yeah. I mean, he knew me. We trusted each other. We've been talking about trying to do something together for years. And when John calls me and says, Matt, are you interested in this? I'm like, mm, sure. You know, it's not yeah. just it's Marvel, but I know the people involved. And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to work with you. again. And the best people, you know, the, the reality is that the good people in the industry want to help other people be successful. They don't see them as competitors. They don't see them as someone who's going to steal from them. They see them as just another creative who, if they can help them to be successful, they want them to be. Those are the good people to, to be friends the, with. And the other thing I'd add for you, if you're going to a conference, if they start telling you this is the only way to do something and you have to buy these supplements and these tapes <laughs> and whatever, walk away and run. <laughs> Go, go to hit the bar for the rest of the weekend or whatever makes you happy. You're, it's just, anytime you get advice from anybody, you take the bits of it that work for you because we all, as artists, do these things individually in our own unique ways. Take the bits that resonate with you and use them. But nobody has a prescription that works for everybody, right? There's no 12-step program that's going to make you the best writer in the world. It just doesn't and exist. That goes yeah, for everything to you said today as well. So yeah. <laughs> take what you can. Hopefully you get some good value from it as you're going along. But yeah. what the hell do I know? Don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, Matt, we are just about out of time, so we're going to have to wrap things up. Hey, I want to thank you again for being oh, on the show. Yeah. It's been great. I hope that we can have you back sometime. And sure. in the meantime, looking forward to Marvel. We'll keep our eyes on that. And of course, <laughs> Shotguns and Sorcery is awesome, so uh, I hope that people will check that out as well because that is a very cool uh, world and very cool books. Um, but you. for now, thank you, Matt. It was good having you on the show. My deep honor. Thank you very much, Mark. All Always right. good to chat. All right, folks. Well, we need to wrap things up now. We're just about out of time. We're going to be bumping into the next show if I don't clean, clear things out here at this point. But thank you all for being here for our very first show. This is fabulous. I really appreciate everyone watching and jumping in with questions and things. Next week, our guest is Terry Brooks. So if you want to hear us talk about Shannara or Shannara, depending on how you prefer to pronounce it, 
Uh, we'll be talking about that next week. So in the meantime, I want to thank everybody and hopefully we'll see you again next week. Talk to you later.